Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Your word is the truth. We receive your word this night, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Please be seated if you would. We're going to be sharing with you tonight on a doctrinal subject, a subject that's an important subject for you to understand and to be established in the truth. And also, I think it would be appropriate for this time because many people are not following the true doctrine of the Lord at this time. The subject is, are Christians under the law? And if so, what law if they are under law? Are Christians under law? And if so, what law? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Did Jesus destroy the law of the Old Testament? No. But he did fulfill it, which means he completed it. He fulfilled it, he completed it, finished that which was spoken of him and all the things that were supposed to come forth through the Old Testament, the law of the Old Testament. We even see that after Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, and he had appeared to those ones here in Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, he was saying unto them, he said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses, in the Prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. He revealed all those things that were fulfilled out of the Law, out of the Prophets, and in the Psalms that were written about Jesus. Now that Jesus has fulfilled that, Romans makes it very clear in chapter 10, over here in verse 4, it says this, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Everyone who believes through faith, we receive Jesus, personal Lord and Savior, and as we walk in His ways, that's how we come into righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. The law could never produce righteousness on its own. It only comes through faith of receiving Jesus, so you get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. So, Christ is the end of the law. That shows the fact that we're not under the Old Testament law any longer. Now, what was the purpose of the law? We need to understand this. In Galatians chapter 3, we see over here in verse 24, he says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. What did the law do? It brought the knowledge of sin. It brought to the revelation of what was sin and what was not sin. And it was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ because it showed them the fact that we need a Savior. We got sin. We need to be saved. And, of course, there's only one person who could do it. It was the Messiah, it was the Christ, so they could be justified by faith. It goes on and says, after faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. So since the law was the schoolmaster, that tells us that once Jesus came, we're no longer under the law, talking about the law of the Old Testament. We see that the law in the Old Testament was a law that dealt with man after the flesh, with its carnal fleshly ordinances. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 16, here it says, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, referring to that which was of the, new, of the Old Testament, but after the power of an endless life. It's talking about Jesus. Not after a carnal commandment. Again, that tells you that the laws of the Old Testament were of the flesh. They were dealing with man after the flesh giving them outward fleshly ordinances that they were to carry out under the Old Testament. So that was the purpose of it at that time. We also see in Hebrews chapter 9, down here in verse 8 and following, the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way in the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. That was simply a replica of the one in heaven, and it was simply the means whereby God's presence could manifest itself during the Old Testament period. We see it was a figure for the time when then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. He could never change them or make them perfect as pertaining to the conscience. No, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances, all these things that were of the flesh or carnal, imposed on them until the time of reformation. The time of reformation came when Jesus came and accomplished the redemption to bring man to be reconciled unto God. We see what Jesus did on the cross in Ephesians in chapter 2. 
Ephesians chapter 2, we see in verse 15, he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, all these carnal ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, or of two, one new man, so making peace. That shows the fact that he abolished this law of commandments because he was the one who fulfilled what it was all about, pointing towards him, and he was the one who fulfilled that so that he could, of course, accomplish the redemption. And he, of course, forced, of course finished the Old Testament and brought in the New Testament. We see again, this is spoken of over here in Colossians in chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, we see over in verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's because of all the sins, because of violating the, law, the carnal commandments, the law of the commandments, which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Jesus blotted all of this out. He's the one who paid the price. So the Old Testament, there, the law was dealt with. It was no longer, we were not under that, and the Old Testament any longer. When we come to the New Testament, after the gospel came and Jesus had gone back to heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, people were born again, received the Holy Spirit, the gospel was beginning to be preached, and they were preaching the gospel. And here it speaks about Stephen. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. You'd think that they would have really grabbed hold of that. Well, then arose certain of the synagogue, which called the synagogue, the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were disputing with him continually. He was, but they weren't able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men and said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. What were they so upset about? They saw the signs and wonders. They saw all the good things that were happening. But they were all upset about the words that he spoke against Moses. That speaks about the law of Moses. And they said they thought that was against God. And so they stirred up the people, and the elders and the scribes came upon him, caught him, and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Of course, remember, because of the fact that Jesus was the final sacrifice, there should have been no more sacrifices that were going forth in the temple any longer. But instead, they continued because they did not accept the sacrifice of Jesus. Now notice he says, they were speaking blasphemous words against the holy place and against the law. They didn't want to let go of the law of the Old Testament. They did not receive what Jesus did, that he was the final sacrifice. He says, we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Well, what did Moses bring? He brought the law. So it's talking about, he said, there's, gonna, there's a change of the law, change of these customs that Moses delivered out of, unto us. Of course, they got upset, and what did they end up doing? They ended up stoning Stephen, stoning him over this. Well, there was continual persecution by those that were Jews. We see in Acts chapter 13, here in verse 39, the statement is made where by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Couldn't be justified by it. No way, and the word justified means to be rendered righteous or to be declared righteous. It couldn't be declared righteous by the law of Moses. Well, this got to the place where there was such a great contention that it really came to a head in Acts chapter 15. In Acts 15, certain men that came down from Judea began to teach the brethren and said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, that's of the Old Testament, a law, you cannot be saved. Wherefore, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them which should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. They weren't going to let this go. They were going to deal with this. So here they came up there, and we see when they come to Jerusalem, verse 4, they were received to the church. The apostles and elders declared all the things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, these are ones who were born again, that believed, saying it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. In essence, they had embraced receiving Jesus, they'd accepted the New Testament, but they also were keeping the Old Testament. They wanted to continue in both, and they said it was needful for them to be circumcised and also to command them to keep the law of Moses. Of course, 
apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and there was quite a dispute about this. It says, when there had been much disputing, that's when Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know how a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And so he began to declare this unto them and telling them the fact down here, he says, Why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, which was about keeping the law. They couldn't, that never produced salvation in the Old Testament, so how, since when was going to do it now? We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. All the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring the miracles and wonders that God wrought through them. And so James then got up and said, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. And so he began to declare, and he comes down to verse uh, um, 19 is this. He says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them from, from, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. They would be all the Gentile believers. We write to them that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. And also, he said down here, though, in verse uh, 24, where this all summed up, where he says, For as much as you've heard, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls. Notice, people that were telling them that they had to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised were actually subverting their souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. There were continual battles about this, but they got this finally dealt with. No, we don't keep the law. There's no commandment to keep talking about the law of the Old Testament. Now, then we come over to Acts chapter 18. Again, wherever Paul was going, there was, they were stirring up all kinds of problems against him as he was trying to bring the gospel to the Jews. In Acts 18, 12, when Galilee was the deputy of Achaia, and the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. They said, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. Again, not to walk or to do things after the ways of the law of Moses. And of course, they were all upset about it. And he says, if it's a question of words or names of your law, look to it, I'll be you, for I will be no judge of such matters. But they were, again, coming after him because of the law. We even see further down in chapter 21. In verse 28, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men is everywhere against the people and the law in this place. And further brought Greeks also in the temple and polluted this holy place. He was teaching about all this stuff of going back into this Old Testament way and against the law, observing these things. You know, that would include the Old Testament commandments, the Ten Commandments. That tells you, tells you something. Since we're not under the law, or are we under the Ten Commandments today? No. Are we under any of the laws of the Old Testament commandments today? No, we're not. But they really came against him continually. Well, you know, we have the same problem today. We have a lot of people that are going back into the Old Testament ways to keep the law and keep all these kind of things, as you will see. Well, that needs to be dealt with, so we don't want to be deceived. In Romans chapter 6, we see it's very clear when it's stated here in verse 4, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. Talking about the Old Testament. But now you're under grace, which is speaking of what? The New Testament. We're not under the Old Testament. We can't be under both at the same time. And there's many people, many Messianic type group people, Hebraic type people that are wanting to go back to Hebrew roots, and they're wanting to keep the law of the Old Testament and keep the law of the New Testament. Keep the Old Testament, keep the New Testament. That's the attitude. And there's many today that are going back into these ways. They do Old Testament things. They do a lot of these things. It's certainly contrary to the Word of God. Romans chapter 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. We're dead to the law by the body of Christ. That you should be married to another, even to him as raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. When you got born again, you're dead to the law. Why would we ever want to go back into keeping the law of the Old Testament? But it's amazing that people want to do these things. Verse 6, Now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. There's now a new way, the newness of spirit. All the things in the New Testament are after the ways of the spirit. The Old Testament was after the oldness of the letter. But notice, we have been delivered from it.
We see over in Galatians in chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, we see down here in verse 19. That I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. We're dead to the law now. There's absolutely no reason for us to keep any of the laws of the Old Testament. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me, in the life which I now live in the flesh, in my physical body. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So now I'm living by the faith of Jesus Christ, because I have the Spirit of Christ within me. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. How could I frustrate the grace of God if I went back into the ways of the Old Testament? For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. But what was the problem with Galatia? The problem with the Galatians were they were going back into the Old Testament ways. And we even see in the next verse, he says, O foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you? Why have you turned away? I mean, Jesus, he was crucified, and why are you going back and not obeying the truth? This only what I learn of you. Receive you the Spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith. Which one produced it for you? It certainly wasn't the works of the law. It was the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? The flesh could never make them perfect by keeping the law in the Old Testament. No way. The only way is now through the Spirit. So here they went back into these ways of the flesh after the carnal commandments of the Old Testament. And we see in verse 5, he says, He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit and works the miracles among you, doeth, it he, doeth he it by the words of works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Again, it's by the hearing of faith. And then we see down in verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it's written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. That means people that are putting themselves back under the law they are now cursed, or everyone that doesn't continue in all things. You'd have to fulfill every little thing, or else you're cursed, because there's no remedy. There's no blood of Jesus to, to, to deal with all that in the Old Testament, of course. That shows the fact that they're in trouble, people that put themselves back in this. And no man's justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And again, now what was the law's purpose? Verse 19, as we mentioned earlier. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions, because of the sins, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That shows the fact that it was simply added because of sin to show forth the fact that they had sin until the seed, and who's the seed? The seed is Christ. We know that from back in verse 16, where it says Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Singular. He said not to seeds as of many, but to as of one, to thy seed, which is Christ. Therefore, they had to wait for the seed to come forth. And, of course, that's exactly what happened. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But could it? Absolutely not. There was no way that it could happen. Even it says it further in Galatians in chapter 5. <coughs> Galatians 5 and verse 18. He says, If you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. How do we now walk in the New Testament of the Spirit? Not after the flesh or after the ways of the law. So, what are, so far we see that Jesus fulfilled the law. He's the end of the law for all believers in him now. The law was of carnal commandments with fleshly ordinances. Jesus abolished it on the cross, blotted it out. And yet they got all this great persecution against them in the New Testament because they rejected this. The Jews would not receive this. Although we see clearly in Paul's teaching Romans and Galatians in these places, the fact that we are now not under the law of the Old Testament. We're dead to the law. We're delivered from the law. We now are not to walk under the oldness of letter. We now are dead to the law that we could live unto God. And the law simply was the schoolmaster that brought us unto Christ, but we're no longer on it any longer. Now over in Colossians, Colossians in chapter 2, we see something over here in verse 16. He said, let no man therefore judge you in meat, which is food, what you're eating, and drink, or in respect of a holy day. The word holy day is not really a good translation. It's this word, heorte, which means actually a feast day, talking about one of the feasts. It says, in respect of a feast, of keeping a feast. 
or of the new moon, which is what the Jews would do, they keep their new moons, the Jewish festivals, or of the Sabbath. Now the word days is not there in the Greek. You can see it's italicized, but the word Sabbath is actually plural in the Greek. That's why Young's translates it Sabbaths. It is plural, referring to the Sabbaths, which would refer to all the Sabbath days. That's why they put it in there. So here, that, what's all this about? This is all under the law. The law with all the dietary laws and all the things they had to do. And, and they had to keep the feasts in an Old Testament physical way in doing these things. And of also keeping the physical Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath that they had to do. Now he's saying, don't let anybody judge you in these things because we're not under these things any longer. He goes on and says, which are a shadow of things to come, or literally of coming things. And literally, it says this can mean but or it can be and, the body of Christ, literally. Where it says the body is of Christ, the word is is not there. There's no verb here in the Greek. It literally says the body of Christ. They were simple, simply shadows of things to come and of the body of Christ and all the things that were going to come forth in the New Testament era. So we can see very clearly that in the Old Testament now, the law has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And we see now in the New Testament, are we under the law of the Old Testament any longer? No. It has been fulfilled. Are we under the Ten Commandments? No. Are we under anything of the Old Testament, whether it's dietary laws, the keeping of the Sabbath, any of these kind of things, keeping of the feasts, physical feast days? No. Not so whatsoever. Now, are the New Testament believers under law? That's the next question we must ask. And the answer is yes. In Hebrews chapter 7, we see a very important scripture in verse 12, and it says this. For the priesthood being changed there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, what's this talking about? Well, there was a change in the priesthood, from the Aaronic priesthood to the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. There's a change in all. It's changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Notice it says there was a change of the law, not an elimination of law, but a change of the law. We are not under the Old Testament law, but that doesn't mean that we're not under law. We are under grace which is the, came through Jesus Christ who brought us into the New Testament, but there's also law of the New Testament. And this is important because a lot of Christians think, that, oh, we're under grace, now we can do whatever we want, we're not under any law. That's not true. There's a lot of people that think they can do that. No, we are under law. What kind of a law are we under? Under the law of the Old Testament? No. Romans chapter 8 says in verse 2, for the law of the Spirit, these are now spiritual laws, not carnal ordinances, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's what we're under now. Makes me free from the law of sin and death. So now there's a law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus. We even see that this law now is to Christ. We show, see this in 1 Corinthians 9, down here in verse 21, where here he's talking about bringing the gospel to those uh, in verse 20, he talks about, Under the Jews I became as a Jew, I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, but I might gain them that are under the law. But then he says in verse 21, To them that are without law, talking about someone that's a Gentile, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, talking about what he, where he was, that I might gain them that are without law. Otherwise, He's now going to the Gentiles. He's trying to gain those that are without law, but he, of course, is under the law to Christ himself. That means he's following a law. What kind of a law? The law of the New Testament, which is the law to Christ. We see this referred to in Galatians chapter 6 in verse 2, where it says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill, what? The law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It is the law of the New Testament. The law of the New Testament are laws of the Spirit, and this is the law of Christ now that you and I are under, which are all the commandments that are given to us in the New Testament that you and I are to follow. In James, we see further, in verse chapter 1, verse 25, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Notice, what do they call this? The perfect law of liberty. What's that? That's the Word of God. Looking into the Word of God in the New Testament, 
the perfect law of liberty. That means the New Testament law is not one that would bring bondage. It's one that brings liberty as we do the word. It's going to bring freedom because this is what Jesus came to bring, liberty and freedom to us. As we continue in the word, we'll be his disciples, we'll know the truth, the truth will make us free or bring us to liberty. So the perfect law of liberty now is what you and I are under. It's referred to as this law of liberty again over in James chapter 2 and verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That tells you something. You and I are going to be judged. How we're going to be before the judgment seat of Christ. We just brought forth a series on that subject. How are we going to be judged before the judgment seat of Christ? According to the law of liberty, according to the law of the New Testament. We also know that Jesus even spoke that when he brought forth the New Testament in John chapter 13, he's teaching about this, and he says in verse 34, he says, a new commandment I give unto you. We have commandments, laws that are commandments we've been told to do. A law is something that we're commanded to do. New commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. When it talks about new, it's a word kainos, which means one that's recent or brand new, something that's fresh. Did they have this, this uh, love, this agape love commandment in the Old Testament? No, they did not. It was New Testament. That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So here we see a commandment given, which is of the law of the New Testament, because all the laws are commands that are given to us, but it's a brand new one on the inside of us. Now, unfortunately, there are those today, and many people that you would probably consider as messianic, there's a lot of them, it seems to be a growing movement in the church world today. And a lot of these people that are in this situation, they keep the Old Testament law as well as the New Testament law. They do Old Testament things, they want to be Torah observant following the Old Testament law, and they also want to follow the New Testament law. They think we follow both. They think we're under all the commandments, and this is why they do the Old Testament things that they do. What are they essentially doing? They're trying to bring the Old Testament into the ways of the New Testament and do it all. It's a major problem. There's quite a thing about wanting to go back to the Hebrew roots on a lot of these things, and a lot of it is all by these ones that are going back into the Old Testament ways. Well, look what we say, says here in Matthew 5. First of all, we've got to realize there's a change, as we saw in Hebrews 7.12, from the Old Testament to the New Testament law. A difference, a change. Matthew 5.27 says, You've heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's Old Testament law. That's one of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? What Jesus say? But I say unto you, now what's he bringing forth? He's now teaching them the change of law from the Old Testament to the New Testament. He's telling them, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So he's saying, we're not under this, you're not going to be under this law of committing adultery, the act anymore. Now you're under a new law, which is you look on a woman even to lust after her with uh, committed adultery where they're already in your heart. You don't have to do the act. If you do it, it's the attitude now of heart. So that ch so shows the fact that there's been a change. Now we've got two different things. Are we going to follow the Old Testament law? Or are we going to follow the New Testament law? Which one are we going to follow? Well, you say, well, I can follow both of those, not commit it, and, and uh, you know, make sure I don't do things with my heart. Well, it might seem like that, that'll work out okay there. Well, how about over here in verse 43, though? Matthew 5, 43 says, You've heard it been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's also from the Old Testament law. They were to love their neighbor and hate their enemy. So, that's Old Testament. We're going to follow, if we're going to be of those that are going to follow both of these, that means we're going to do both these things. But what does Jesus say? But I say unto you, now he's saying there's something new here, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, this change is not like something maybe a little bit more that you have to deal with. It's just not committing the adultery, but now you can't look with lust in your heart, you know, added to it, so to speak. But this is now a change, a different one. There's a change for sure, because 
This one says, hate your enemy, Old Testament. This one says, love your enemy, they're opposites. Now, for all those people that think that we're going to follow the Old Testament law and the New Testament law, which one are you going to follow? Well, I follow both of them. Well, you can't follow both of them here, can you? You can't hate your enemy and love your enemy at the same time. What's that tell you? You can't be under two laws at once because the covenants are different. So all these people that tell you to follow the Old Testament laws and the New Testament laws and go back to the Torah and be Torah observant and do all these things of the Old Testament, you can't do both. You're either going to follow the Old Testament or you're going to follow the New Testament because you can't do both, evidenced by this. There's no way you can hate your enemy and love your enemy at the same time. So that destroys all of the work that these people have been doing, which is bringing quite a division in the body of Christ, even in this hour. And it's error. It's great error. It's the spirit of Galatia, going back into the same thing, going back into the law of commandments under the Old Testament, and they're in trouble. And remember, if they don't keep the whole thing, they're going to be cursed. That's a serious business. You don't want to be ever put yourself in a position that you're doing Old Testament laws and thinking that you're following God's ways. No, we want to follow New Testament laws and follow the way of the New Testament. See, Jesus taught a change in everything, we've got to realize. We know there was a change of covenant. Are we under the Old Covenant any longer? No. And was the, uh, is the New Covenant a merging together of the Old and the New? No, it's not. Elimination of the old and a brand new one. Hebrews 10, 9. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first. That's the, the Old T T Testament. That he may establish the second. He finished it. He took away the first. So how can we be under the first and the second at the same time? We can't. He took away the first. See, the old covenant now is something that we do not walk after. Hebrews chapter 8 Verse 6, now he's obtained a more excellent ministry by how much he's the mediator of a better covenant, which is established on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, everything was perfect with it. There should be no place had been sought for the second, but it wasn't because it was made for man after the flesh with all its kernel ordinances. It could never bring anybody to the place of righteousness. It could never cause the new birth to come forth. It could never bring a person to perfection whatsoever. Instead, it just brought the knowledge of sin, and they, here they were, you know, knowing that they need a Savior. Finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, <clears throat> saith the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Where was the word written in the Old Testament? It was written on tables of stone. Where is it now written in the New Testament? It's written in our heart, and it's written in our mind. There has been an absolute change. How about the priesthood? It was changed from the priesthood of Aaron, where only a person could be a priest, to now the priesthood under the order of Melchizedek, which, who, what was, what was he? He was a king and a priest. And what are you and I now? Well, Revelation 1.6 tells us what we become. He's made us kings and priests unto God. They couldn't be that way in the Old Testament. If you want to be under the Old Testament, you can't be a king and a priest at the same time. It was, it was, you couldn't do that. You can only be one or the other. So we don't want to be under the Old Testament. We want to be a king and we want to be a priest at what we're supposed to be. The way into the priesthood in the Old Testament was by physical birth, and you could only be of one tribe, the tribe of Levi. How about the New Testament? Now everybody can come into the priesthood, but it does nothing to do with physical birth, because was Jesus of the tribe of Levi? No, he was the tribe of Judah. So could he even become a priest under the Old Covenant? No. So there had to be a change in the priesthood, and there is, and a change in the way into the priesthood. It couldn't be by physical birth now, it's by birth, but what way? By spiritual birth, because Jesus was the first born from the dead. He experienced spiritual birth. He got a brand new spirit on the inside of him. He was the first born from the dead. Spiritual birth. 
So now everybody can come into the priesthood in the New Testament. There was a change in the temple. God was dwelling in a temple made with hands in the Old Testament, but now where is he dwelling? He's dwelling in temples made without hands, which is what? You and me. He's now come. You and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's come to dwell in us, so there's a change. Also, who are the ones that are now? Is, what, is God, what does he think about Jews and Greeks now? Well, we need to realize there's a change. In Romans chapter 10, verse 12, there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. God doesn't see any Jew or Greek any longer. The same Lord is over all, is rich unto all that call upon him. Talking about those that have come to receive him as personal Lord and Savior. We see it again over in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28. He says this, There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. He didn't even look at you as male or female. That's why people think are oh, women, you can't be in ministry because you're a woman. He doesn't look that way. There's no problems. He didn't have any problems with women function in ministry. He didn't have problems with them. No Jew nor Greek any longer. We're all one in Christ. We even see a third case where it speaks about this over in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11 where he says where there is neither where there's neither Jew or Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, uh, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So there again, there isn't any any longer. In fact, there's a change in who is a Jew. Is there still a Jew around? Yeah, there's a Jew, but it's not a natural Jew. It's now a spiritual Jew. Romans chapter 2, and verse 28. Who are the spiritual Jews? All of us that are born again. Look what it says in Romans 2, 28. He is not a Jew, because there are Jews now, but it's not talking about natural Jews and natural Greek people. Instead, there's only spiritual ones. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, whose circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit. Not in letters, praise is not of men, but of God. So who is now a Jew? All born again believers, one inwardly. You and I are true Jews because what is a Jew? A spiritual Jew who has come into relationship with God. And, of course, circumcision is not of the flesh any longer. It's now of the heart on the inside of us, where we got a brand new heart. Do we have the fleshly ordinances of the Old Testament any longer? To keep any of the physical things that we're supposed to keep? Sabbath, all these things, feast days, all these things? No. Now we have spiritual ordinances of the laws, the commandments of the New Testament that you and I are to keep. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could only be with them but now the Holy Spirit could come to dwell in us in the New Testament, praise God. In the Old Testament, they didn't have authority over the devil. They couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't cast out the demons. But now in the New Testament, we can cast out the demons. We have authority over all the power of the enemy, and we can be set free from the bondage of the enemy. In the Old Testament, they were servants. In the New Testament, now we're sons and daughters to God. Now we have a free approach to come into the very presence of God. They did not have that in the Old Testament. God was simply God to them in the Old Testament. But now in the New Testament, he's our Heavenly Father. Because you and I are all children of God, born again. As we talked about in bringing out about the information about prayer, in the Old Testament, they were always asking, requesting, petitioning, waiting to see if God would respond, didn't know if they were going to have any confidence. They had no confidence in that whether he'd respond to their prayers for sure or not. But in the New Testament now, remember the word Iteo, which is the word for ask in the New Testament. We make a demand, a spiritual demand of what's due us, literally is what it means. And we Lombano take hold of the promises that have already been given to us. And we do it with confidence, knowing that he hears our prayers and knowing that we have what we pray, as we saw in 1 John chapter 5. That's confidence in prayer. That's a big difference. In the Old Testament, the sin was only covered over once a year. But now... Our sins not just covered over, they're washed away by the blood of Jesus. And not just once a year, they can be washed away continually. We can be walking free from sin. The Old Testament, they had all their physical sacrifices they had to offer up. All these people that want to go back under Old Testament ways, you know, I say, well, did you offer your physical sacrifice today? Well, we don't do that anymore. Well, then why are you doing anything of the Old Testament anymore? What do we offer now? spiritual sacrifices as we see 
you and I are to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God, as it says in 1 Peter 2, 5. Your lively stones, your build up a spiritual house, holy praise, priesthood, offer up spiritual sacrifices. You see, everything in the new covenant is spiritual. And everything is going to be in the spirit, not this fleshly outward stuff. All of the fleshly outward things are of the Old Testament, and they're all of the flesh. And remember, when you're in the flesh, you can't please God. And that does, God doesn't even take heed to the things that are of the flesh whatsoever. Now also, some people are keeping the physical dietary laws. There's whole denominations that are keeping the physical dietary laws of the Old Testament, as well as the Jewish people, naturally, that call themselves that, even though God doesn't recognize them as that today. And it's amazing that some Christian groups are, you know, a lot of them are still are keeping the dietary laws. That's the Old Testament. Are we under that now? No. Romans chapter 14, what did Paul say? He said in verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean of itself, talking about foods that would come in and cause me to be unclean. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, it's him it's unclean. If he believes it's unclean, then it's going to be unclean to him. But there isn't anything. So, again, this is error that whole denominations have allowed themselves to enter into because they have failed to realize we're not under the Old Testament law any longer. The fact that they're attempting to keep it, they're in trouble. Because if you don't keep the whole thing, remember, you're cursed. Matthew, it's really a denial of what Jesus has done if you want to go back into keeping the Old Testament laws, commandments. Matthew chapter 15, over here in verse 11, even tells us something. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defiles a man. So can food going into me defile me from God's perspective? No. Now, does that mean, oh, I'll just go out and eat anything I want? Well, you can. If I'm, you know, it's not, it's not going to be sin. Of course, you want to have wisdom. You eat things that might not be too good because man's messed with it and can cause you a lot of problems. It's, you know, we got to be wise in what we eat. You know? At the same time, is this going to be sin, though? No. That what comes out of a man's mouth, which is coming out of his heart, that is what defiles a man. Also, is the physical Sabbath in the Old Testament is that something that we keep today? No. We now have a spiritual Sabbath that we enter into his rest by possessing the promises of God. I've written a book on this subject, The True Revelation of the Sabbath, a very important revelation for the body of Christ. But again, many Christian groups, many people think that they're supposed to keep the Sabbath. In fact, they get quite an argument even over this. Is it the Saturday or is it the Sunday? Which day is the Sabbath? Which day do we have to keep? In reality, there is no sab Sabbath day, particular day in the New Testament. There isn't any more. Daily, they were preaching and teaching the Word. Daily, they were doing things. They weren't keeping any particular day in the Old Testament. It's been eliminated. Why? Because Jesus is our rest. And Sabbath means rest. And Jesus is the one who brought forth the rest. So when he came, he fulfilled what the Sabbath was all about. So there's no Sabbath. It's all in the person of Jesus Christ. And there's one thing that we've got to realize. Does that mean that I don't have to do anything about Sabbath? No, there's a spiritual Sabbath. You've got to understand that you and I are to, to enter into. We see it from Hebrews 4.1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. We're supposed to enter into his rest. That any of you should seem to come short of it. What's that tell you? Entering into his rest is when promises are being possessed in our life. We don't want a promise being left us. If it's left us, we haven't entered into his rest. So entering into his rest is as you possess the promises of God. And God says we should have the fear of God before us so that we don't come short of it. And he goes on and says how we do this, of course. Verse 2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. That's the word of God. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. That tells you that you and I, when we receive the Word of God, we are to mix the Word that we hear with our faith, acting on the Word, working our, or we work our faith, because faith has corresponding action of works, otherwise it's dead, doing the Word, and in doing so, then we, of course, what's the result of doing the Word? We enter into the promises. And what's the result of that? We enter into His rest. Verse 3, for we which have believed do enter into his rest. 
you lose a little bit from what's being sent, said here because this particular verb, to enter, is in the present tense. In this program, we can bring up tense, voice, and mood, which are very important for understanding what's said. We which have believed are entering, you would translate it this way, because the present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. We who have believed are entering into rest. How are we entering into rest? Through possessing the promises of God. And we even see down here in verse 6, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, they to whom it was first preached, which was who? The Jews, entered in, not, entered not in because of unbelief. They didn't enter in. It was available for them, but they were in unbelief. They didn't enter in. They ended up dying out in the wilderness. Now we see in verse 8, here it says, if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of the day? What is it talking about? The word for Jesus is the same word for Joshua in the Greek, and it shouldn't have been translated Jesus. <coughs> it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about Joshua, because Joshua is the one that led them to the promised land in the Old Testament. <coughs> and it says, if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day, which is what? The day when Jesus would come in the New Testament. So it should be translated Joshua, and all translations translated Joshua, except the King James has made a mistake here. So they didn't get rest in the Old Testament. It's Jesus who brings us into that. Then verse 9 tells us something. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And who are the people of God? Those who are born again. And what kind of a rest are we talking about? This now is a different word for rest. It is the word sabbatismos, from which we would get our word Sabbath, talking about a spiritual Sabbath rest, which is what we enter into in the New Testament, that remains to the people of God that you and I are to enter into. And what is that? We already saw. That's possessing the promises of God. He that's entered into his rest, he's ceased from his works as God did from his. What are we supposed to do? Work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, entering into the promises of God, which is entering into his rest. And as we enter into rest, we'll cease from our works because we've accomplished them, just as God finished his works and rest. Then it says in verse 11, let us labor. And the word labor is the word sparadzo in the Greek, which means to be diligent. Let us make haste and be diligent, therefore, to enter into that rest, showing the fact that you and I are to enter into the rest of the Lord, which is the spiritual rest. Now, Keeping a physical Sabbath, is that entering into spiritual rest? No. Is that possessing the promises of God? No. No, not whatsoever. It's a spiritual rest that we enter into through our faith as we possess the promise of God. And so we're not to fall off to the same example of unbelief. And of course, how do we do it? It's through the Word, the Word of God. That's, that's alive, and it's powerful or active. And what's it going to do? The Word of God is what's going to bring you the promises, because what you're to do is you're to hold fast your profession of it, you're speaking forth the word, that's putting your faith in operation to see yourself enter into the promises. And it talks about in verse 16, how we come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain, or this Greek word is lambano, meaning to take hold of mercy. We take hold of mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Taking hold of mercy, that's what we're taking hold of the promises that belong to us. So this is what we're doing to enter into the rest that he has is by possessing the promises of God. Now we also need to just note, Jesus came, and remember, he is the fulfillment of what the Sabbath was all about, which is entering into rest, the spiritual rest, because he is the rest. In Mark chapter 2, verse 23, it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day. That meant Jesus was traveling on the Sabbath day, doesn't it? <clears throat> Were they allowed to travel on the Sabbath day? No. That was a violation of the law. And his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. Were they allowed to work? That's working, isn't it? No, that was a no-no. Therefore, they were working, they were traveling, and that was, you know, they were hungry, they were going to eat this, that they were going to pluck. Couldn't, you know, that was not what they should be doing. That shows the fact that Jesus did not keep the Sabbath as far as from a physical standpoint. Why? Because he was the fulfillment of what it was all about, which is he is our rest. And we enter into rest as we possess everything that he has for us.
And we see, <clears throat> it says the Sabbath, the King James says was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's not a good translation because the word made here is the word ginemai. Ginemai means not made. It means to become, is one of the things it means, become, but it also can mean to come into existence as it brings out here. And so really that's probably a better way to translate. The Sabbath came into existence for man, not man, for the Sabbath. In other words, why did the Sabbath come into existence for man? Because it was a physical rest pointing towards Jesus who was coming, the Messiah. Everything in the Old Testament they did was all pointing towards the Messiah coming, who was the real rest, who was the real fulfillment of it, and brought it forth. So the physical rest pointed towards the spiritual rest, who is Jesus. In fact, it's interesting, if you look at what Jesus did on the Sabbath day, he healed the sick, cast out the demons, did these works of God. What's that a revelation of? If he's our rest, and he's coming to do something on the Sabbath day, and it has something to do with us so we can enter into rest, that's a revelation of what he wants to do in our lives to bring us into the rest, which is what? Get us healed so we possess the promises of God and come into rest. Get us delivered, cast out the demons so that we come to the place of being rest. So the things that he did on the Sabbath were showing us what he wants to do in our life in the New Testament, which is what he does through us, to get healed, to get delivered, so that we come into entering into his rest as we possess the promises of God. Now there's another thing. In the Old Testament, they kept the physical feasts. They were keeping the feast days. Well, do we do that now? Do we keep the physical feast days of Passover? And these are the feasts of the Lord. Unleavened bread, all these different ones. No, we don't keep them in the physical sense. But also, remember, each one of these has a spiritual fulfillment or application for us. We saw that in every case. There is one. There's two aspects of this. One, to celebrate and proclaim what Jesus did in fulfilling the feasts of the Lord on the exact day. Because the feasts of the Lord were God's feasts, and what they are teaching is that what Jesus was going to do in the fulfillment of them in accomplishing the work in man. And he did it on the exact day in those first four feasts. What happened on Passover? Jesus became, he went to the sin, going to the cross, becoming sin for us, the Passover lamb, in order to accomplish the redemption. And so he fulfilled that. But there's also a second aspect of this is the spiritual application of the feast in our lives through the work of Jesus Christ in our life. And you're going to see this in a moment when we show you in a scripture. The spiritual application of this is what? Well, we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, and what's the result of him taking away our sins? Now we could be born again. And the application of Passover in our life is the fact that now we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, and we get born again. Also, what else all happened at the time of the Passover? They had to leave Egypt. What's Egypt a type of? The world. What's that telling us? It's also showing the fact that the fulfillment in our life is we leave the world. We separate from the ways of the world. We can't come to the Lord and continue in the ways of the world whatsoever. <clears throat> also, they, had, they went through the Red Sea to be separated, didn't they? What's that all talking about? That's all a type of water baptism, which, remember, did not get rid of the filth of the flesh. But instead, it was acknowledging, water baptism acknowledges publicly that we have received Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, that we've come into the priesthood, and that we now belong to him, and that we're through with the world. And of course, that show, gives us a good conscience before God, as 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about. So what do we see? Uh, the, per, the application for us is the fact that we get born again, we leave the world, we acknowledge the fact that we've been separated from this, the ways of the world. We've come into the priesthood by spiritual birth, and now we're going to walk in his ways. And also, what else is something that we can receive? Healing. Remember, it's over in uh, Psalms 105, where it talks about those that came out of the uh, Exodus. It says over in Psalms 105, verse 37. <clears throat> he brought them forth also with silver and gold, prosperity, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. They were all healed. Can you imagine all those millions, those ones coming out of there? Nobody was sick. What's that tell you? Healing now is available for every one of us, and we can all be healed. 
We can all be prospered. We can all be blessed, praise God. What's the second one? The area of unleavened bread. And we'll be talking about this in a minute when we see the application of it. But the, un the unleavened bread was Jesus bearing away the sins for the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You'll be hearing this this following week when we talk about the plan of redemption, the redemptive work of Jesus. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, bearing away the sin, paying the price. And after he did that, he satisfied the claims of justice, and then he was raised from the dead. And that's what they, what they do in the Old Testament. They, they were putting away the leaven, getting, getting rid of, to get the house clean, which is exact all type of sin, which is what Jesus did in putting away the sin. At the same time, what's the personal application of this? Is the fact that we got to deal with sin in our life and put away sin so we walk free from all areas of sin because sin has no more dominion over us now. And we are to walk free. In fact, we're to triumph over all sin in our life. First fruits was resurrection, the fulfillment. See, there's three feasts that occurred. <clears throat> there was Passover. Jesus became the Passover lamb on the day of Passover. Feast of unleavened bread, which was the taking away of all the leaven which is all type of sin, which is what Jesus did for the three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, and then being raised from the dead, which is first fruits, which speaks of resurrection. And the fulfillment of that is now that you and I have been raised from the dead, now we're alive unto God, we've come out of the world, we now are in relationship with him, we de dealt with sin in our life, now we're gonna walk and live the resurrection life. We're gonna walk in the ways of the Lord. We're gonna live holy unto the Lord. We're gonna bring forth fruit and all the things that God wants to bring forth in our life. So they were proclaiming, what do we do? Do we celebrate these days physically? No. We're going to proclaim in their seasons what Jesus has done for us, how he fulfilled those, and the application of those in our life as we carry them out. Now there's some people that say, well, there's a couple scriptures here though that seem to say we're supposed to keep the feasts. Well, Acts chapter 18, verse 21 is one we ought to look at. <clears throat> this is Paul wanting to, he was going to go back to Jerusalem, and he says this, He bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. This is Paul speaking. Was Paul one who kept the feasts? No. We know that from Colossians 2, where he said, Don't let anybody judge you in the f keeping a feast or any of these kind of things. And he was speaking against the law and all these things. Well, what's the problem here? The translation didn't do a good job. The word keep is normally a Greek word, tereo, is the normal word spoken if you know this word in the Greek. But this particular word here is the word poeo. Poeo is the word that is translated make or do almost exclusively throughout the New Testament. <clears throat> do, 357 times, make 113 times. What this should have been translated is, it must by all means make this feast. In other words, he wanted to get to the feast, not keep the feast. Why did he want to get to the feast? Because that's where all the Jews would be, where he could preach the gospel to them, to try to get them to get, receive Jesus and be born again. Because what did he do? He came to preach the gospel to them. And so that's why he had wanted to leave. He says, I gotta go, I gotta go get to these other ones, and so I gotta get to the time when all these Jews are coming to Jerusalem so he could preach the gospel to them. Another place that's important to understand is over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and this gives you some insight on how you keep a feast. Because people say, well, we're supposed to keep the feast because the Bible says so. Well, they're right. Let's look at the scripture for a moment. 1 Corinthians 5, 8 says, Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sounds like we're supposed to keep the feast. And when it talks about keeping the feast, it talks about keeping or celebrating a feast day, in a sense. But remember, do we keep a physical day? No, we've already seen this. So what is all this talking about? This is talking about us, so this is talking about the spiritual application of what the feast is all about for us to carry out. Well, in order to understand this, first of all, we need to go back and look at the beginning of the chapter. <clears throat> Furthermore, this had nothing to do with a particular day because it's talking about keeping the feast in their life through the spiritual application based on what Jesus had done, as you'll see. 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 1, it's reported commonly there's fornication among you, such fornications as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. That's incest. That's terrible. Incestual relationship was going on. Did the church deal with it? No. Was it sin? Yes. 
you're puffed up, you've not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from you. You should have dealt with this guy. He didn't want to come to repentance. You should have disfellowshipped him and got rid of him and taken him out of the church. For I verily is absent in the body, but present spirit have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. <clears throat> in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be or might be saved, literally, in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's if he came to the place of repentance. That's the only way it would happen. The reason you know that, by the way, is because this is the subjunctive mood, talking about this part, which means this is not automatic that he'd be saved. Some people read this in and say, well, that meant the spirit was going to be saved anyway? No. That the spirit might be saved. There's five moods in the Greek. The indicative mood is a mood of reality or a factual statement. That's not a factual statement. This is a subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood in the Greek means something that's conditional upon conditions being met, expresses things that are contrary to fact. So he's saying that the spirit might be saved, because it's aorist tense, which is a past, simple past tense, in the day of the Lord. And now what would be the conditions that have to be met for him to be saved? He'd have to repent, because what happens to fornicators? Fornicators, they end up in the lake of fire. Fornicators don't enter the kingdom. Fornicators are in trouble, as the Bible says. So, now we got sin, and they hadn't dealt with it. Your glory is not good. You were just letting this, you were puffed up and letting this thing go. Know ye not that a little leaven, what's leaven a type of? Sin. Leaveneth the whole lump. So what's he saying? A little leaven, which is sin in your church, leavens, or contaminates, so to speak, for the sun, the sin, sin the whole lump, which means it contaminates the whole church. You're contaminated, essentially, is what he's saying to the, he's speaking to the church here at Corinth. Purge out, cleanse out, literally this means. Therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. Get rid of this sin. You can't have sin going on, this thing, that known sin that the person won't repent. That you may be a new lump. And you are unleavened. Well, in spirit they were, because they had the spirit of Christ in them. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us which means he took away the sin, he's the one who accomplished the redemption, and, and now we can be totally free from it, and because of that, how can you have, if Jesus was your one who sacrificed for you, as your Passover, he paid the price for it, how can you allow sin to go on in your midst like this? He goes on and says, therefore, now the word therefore really means so that. It really means so that. If you look down below the word hoste, so that. And so if you look at this together, Young's brings this out as well, very well. He says, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, so that... Now they got, let us keep the feast, which is not the best way to translate this at all. Because this particular word here is in the present tense, which means continuous repeated action. It's in the subjunctive mood, which means say, speaking something that's conditional upon conditions being met. Because it's the present tense, you would translate this so that we may keep the feast, as Young's brings it out. He translates this very good according to the Greek, the way it should have been translated. So what he's saying there is this. Even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us so that we may keep the feast, telling we got to keep the feast. Now, how would we be keeping the feast? What are we just talking about? Jesus dealt with the sin. How would they be keeping the feast? They weren't keeping the feast because what were they doing? They were allowing the sin to stay. So how were they supposed to keep the feast experientially in a spiritual application? Get rid of it. Get rid of the guy. Keep the feast not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity. Otherwise, they had to deal with this thing. They had to purge this thing out. Now, this word sincerity is an interesting word. It is a word here, elikrinia, and this particular word actually comes, when you look it up in the lexicons, which I have, it means to strictly be judged, the word krine is part of this, strictly judged by the light of the sun, because the word helia is where you get the word sun, light of the sun. And what it's talking about is they're supposed to be judged by the light, essentially, which is referring to what? The word of God. So, if you're going to judge something by the word of God, <coughs> then that means you're going to be 
dealing with this thing to get rid of the sin. And that's literally what it's talking about. What with the unleavened, there's no word for bread there, by the way. It was added by the translator. How are we supposed to keep this feast in a spiritual application? With the unleavened sincerity or purity, moral purity, because they deal with the sin and truth, which of course is in line with the word, which is what? Deal with the sin and get rid of this problem. In fact, he even goes on and says, hey, I wrote you an epistle not to company with fornicators. Why are you even accompanying with this guy? Yet all, all together, the fornicators of this world, the covetous, extortioners, or idolaters, you must needs go out of this world. Judgment would come upon them. He even says, I've called you not to keep company. If any man that's called a brother, which supposedly he was, be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, or drunkard, or extortioner, with such a one, you don't even eat. It's contaminating you. What have I to do to judge them though also without? Do you not you judge them they're within? They were expected to judge them. So how were they supposed to keep the feast? By judging the sin and getting this thing dealt with. It's the spiritual application. Did it have anything with keeping a day? No, it has nothing to do with keeping a day. The spiritual application of the feast, and you'll hear this when we talk about the feast of the Lord that are going to be coming up in the next messages that we're going to be doing. We're going to bring forth about the personal application of the feast of the Lord in your life and how you apply it in order to carry it out. Because we do keep the feasts from a spiritual standpoint of the application of them based on what Jesus did in the work of God in us, which in this case is get rid of the sin. Get rid of the sin. And that's what they were supposed to do. But they didn't. So do we keep these physical feasts? That's not going to solve anything. That's not going to get us anything. Remember, doing things in the physical is all in the flesh. Is that going to give us, make us pleased with God? No. Are we going to be accepted with God by doing things in the flesh? No way. The keeping of the feast is, the, and from a standpoint of what we proclaim at this time, is not only teaching what Jesus did, but also the keeping of it in our own lives and in the church so that we now see what Jesus accomplished being brought forth in our life. And you'll see this later. Because we're talking about the leaven of Corinth, the leaven of Galatia, the leaven of Pharise the Pharisees, the leaven of Herod, the leaven of uh, all, all the different leaven that they had. They get rid had to get rid of the leaven of Galatia, the leaven of Corinth, and all these things it refers to in the New Testament, which is the application in our life of getting rid of these particular areas of sin that need to be dealt with. <clears throat> then there's another group out there that says, well, we should be keeping the Passover Seder. And there's lots of people that are doing this kind of thing today. Lots of Christians in the Messianic groups. Is that what we should be doing? No, it's wrong. Why? Because what did Jesus do? He brought a memorial now. And what's the memorial? The memorial changed. How do we know that there's a memorial that changed? Because what, what were they doing every year? They had to keep this Passover Seder. And what was the purpose of it? It was looking for the, in obedience to God and also waiting for the Messiah to show up. They were, that was what the whole thing was. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. When the Passover Seder, you got these four these places where everybody's sitting. They got these four cups of wine that you had to drink. And they got one place setting where you set it. And nobody was to sit there. And the third cup that they had was placed there. And uh, nobody could drink it because that was for Elijah, who was supposed to come in. In fact, even in the, when you do this little feast thing that the Jewish do and these Messianics do, they'll open up the door, which is the custom, and if you're supposed to let Elijah come in, of course he doesn't come in because it's already been done long ago. But these are the kind of things that they do. It's the way of the Jewish keeping of the feast. <clears throat> and this is not of the Lord, of course, because Jesus made a change. Luke chapter 22. Let's look at verse 15. Here Jesus said, he's now he's talks about the pa he's going to be being on the Passover the day of Passover he's going to become sin and he took the cup he gave thanks take this and divide it among yourselves this is the time of the Passover I say unto you I'll not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come he took the bread gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying this is my body which is given for you this do in remembrance of me this is a time when they would be celebrating a Passover meal but they weren't celebrating a Passover meal because Jesus was showing we're not doing this Passover Seder anymore. Why? Because I'm the Messiah, and we're not waiting for him to come in anymore. I'm the real deal, essentially, and now it's going to be a new memorial. He says, now you're going to, this is my body given for you, you're going to do it in remembrance of me. Of course, they didn't understand what was going on, but he's proclaiming these things. Likewise, also, the, take, 
the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. What's Jesus doing? He's saying, there's a replacement now. The Passover Seder is done away with because now we have a new covenant and now we have something new, which is communion, holy communion. And the Bible says that they only kept this once a year. But now we keep communion, what, as often as we want. So praise God. There's a new, new, as a change. Jesus replaced the Passover Seder with communion. Now, in the Passover Seder, it was a Jewish ritual festival. festival. They, would, uh, they would tell the story of how they came out of Egypt, liberated from captivity, and they would drink their four cups of wine. They'd eat the matzah. They had to partake in of all these symbolic foods about all their terrible times that they had, the bitter times and so forth that went on in Egypt. And uh, why would we want to go back and keep that today? Is there anybody in the New Testament that ever kept a Passover Seder after the New Testament came into being? Never. What are we supposed to do and continually supposed to do? Keep communion. Is there any reason to go back to the old? No. Well, we'll kind of learn what they did there. <clears throat> well, we can just teach it. Why go back and do it? Because it's almost a denial of what Jesus did. Because you have to understand what the Seder is all about. When they went back and do, did this, Again, you've got these four cups that they bring in. The first cup was called the cup of sanctification and freedom when they came out from the Egyptians. The second cup was a cup of deliverance, proclaiming all that. A third cup was called the cup of redemption, which was for Elijah, was put at the table with a place setting. Nobody could sit there. It was an empty chair. Open the door, let Elijah come in, and we're waiting for him to come in and announce that the, pass that the Messiah is coming. Well, that's essentially saying the Messiah hasn't come. And the fourth cup was called the cup of thanksgiving and hope that the Messiah will come sometime for us. Now, in order to, if you participate in that, you're essentially carrying out this, this, all that the Jews have done in denying that Jesus came. Is that a good thing for us to do? No. In essence, the Passover Seder is a denial that Jesus has come by participating in it. Some groups want to keep do these things. It's not a good thing. Now, one other thing we want to cover before we conclude some groups say, well, we're supposed to keep the Old Testament commandments now still. And they bring one particular man who is of the messianic type teaching. I want to just address this. It will help for anybody that might have heard this type of thing. In 2 John 1, 6, he says, this is love that we walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment that as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And this is what they teach. And his conclusion was, now wait a minute, it says, as you've heard from the beginning. Well, when was the beginning? Back there in the Garden of Eden, the time of creation. That was the beginning. So since this talks about the commandment from the beginning, this means, in reality, we're, all the commandments we're supposed to do are keep those from the very beginning, way back in the beginning. That would include the whole era, Old Testament era, all the commandments, and including all the Old Testament commandments. Well, is the beginning always talking about that? No. In fact, we can even tell. He talks about a new commandment unto you that we, which we had from the beginning that we love one another. What was the new commandment? Loving one another. Did they have the commandment to love one another in the garden? No. Did they have the commandment to love one another? God may love anywhere in the Old Testament. No. What beginning are we talking about? The beginning of the gospel, not the beginning of creation. Can we even see this? Yeah, in fact, I took the time. I'll show you some of these scriptures rather quickly of looking through this to do a study. Because what are you going to do? I'm going to look up every word beginning. I'm going to find out all the uses of it. Because this helps. Because this is a man who's very well known in these circles that proclaims this verse teaches that we're supposed to keep the Old Testament commandments. It's error. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hmm. That, doesn't mean the, that didn't begin way back in the Garden of Eden, did it? Luke chapter 1, verse 2. Even as they delivered unto us, un, them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. The beginning of what? The beginning of the gospel when people were ministering the word. How about in John chapter 2, when it talks about when Jesus here, the beginning of miracles. When did he do the beginning of miracles? Back in a Garden of Eden? No when he began the miracles at that point in time, 
at the wedding of Cana. In John chapter 6, verse 64. The point is, people can take things and try to make something out of it, believe what they want, when it's not even what it's talking about. John 6, 64. There are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. He's talking about the disciples. He's not talking about from back in the time of Garden of Eden. He's talking about the ones that betrayed him. He knew from the very beginning when he selected the disciples. John 8, verse 25. They said unto them, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of when he preached the gospel to them and began to tell them who he was. John chapter 15, verse 27. You also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Talking about all the disciples. Were they with him in the Garden of Eden? No, not, they weren't there. Where were they with him at from the time of his ministry? Again, showing you that the beginning is talking about the beginning of the gospel. John 16, 4. He says, These things I've told you that when the time shall come, you remember that I told you of them. These things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you talking about the beginning of his ministry. Here's another place where we see about what beginning means. And none of these, these are all in the New Testament, same word in the Greek, but it's, you have to look at what it's talking about. Acts 11:15. as I began to speak, this is Peter declaring this, he said, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Otherwise, the same way the Holy Spirit came on us at the beginning, when? That's the book of Acts, the time when the Holy Spirit was poured out of them on the day of Pentecost. Again, we even see it. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 15, here it talks about the fact that it says here uh, that in the beginning of the gospel, so when can the beginning be? The beginning of the gospel. And this is what it's talking about throughout the New Testament. And when it talks about the beginning is when he gave us the commandment to walk in love back there. Colossians 1.18 the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he might have all the preeminence. When was Jesus the firstborn from the dead? And when he was born from the dead, when he, after he was paid the price for the three days and three nights. That was the beginning of what? The church. The church didn't begin way back there in the Garden of Eden. That's the time of the beginning. Again, we see this time and time again. We can even see in 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, we looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. What beginning? The beginning of when they had dealings with him. And there's more of them, on and on and on. The point being is that you'll have people out there that'll try to take scriptures out of context and points and say, beginning, well, that must mean at the very beginning of time, we're supposed to keep all the commandments, everybody. No, it's a lie. It's talking about the beginning of the gospel. So, it's important that we realize the bottom line of all that we said, which is what? We are not under the Old Testament, and we don't keep the laws of the Old Testament any longer. It means we don't keep the Ten Commandments. Now, a lot of Christians, that just blows their mind. Well, I thought everybody was supposed to keep the Ten Commandments. Nope. We're under now the New Testament, and a lot of people think, I can do anything I want. You know, the hyper-grace teaching. I can just do whatever I want now. Nope. You're under law, the law of Christ and you're to carry out the law, the commandments of the New Testament and walk in the light of them. They had great contention. But we also see this. The other point is there's no way you can keep both at the same time. We saw that evidenced by Matthew 5, 43 and 44. You can't hate your enemy and love your enemy at the same time. And if you keep the Old Testament law, what happens? You're going to be judged by everything. And if you don't keep every single one perfect one, you're cursed. Therefore, am I going to keep the Old Testament laws? No way. If you want to keep the Old Testament laws, get ready for curses to come upon you because you probably won't keep every single one of them. What do we should keep? The New Testament laws. Do not, do not let yourself fall into anything of keeping Old Testament laws. You are a New Testament believer in Jesus Christ, and now we are believers, Christians, that are under law, not the Old Testament law, but the New Testament law. And don't let anybody take you into any of these physical things. These, all these physical things, whether it's Sabbath or keeping this or keeping uh, you know, particular days or whatever it might be, feast days, all these different things, 
is all error, and it is wrong. It is contrary to the Word of God. Instead, now we're going to keep the law of the New Testament, which is everything in the Spirit, and it all has to do with the work of Jesus, though he's accomplished and what he's doing in our life. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that clearly answers whether believers in Christ are under law, and if so, what law? I see clearly I'm not under the law of the Old Testament. It's been fulfilled. I am under law in the New Testament, the law of Christ, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of liberty. I am going to walk according to the Word of God, and I will keep the Word of God, the commandments, the laws of the New Testament, so I will walk in fellowship with the Lord all the days of my life. I will not allow any of these physical observances of Old Testament things to be involved in my life. Because I'm not going to keep the Old Testament ways. I'm walking in the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. I am walking in the Spirit, keeping the laws of the Spirit, walking in fellowship with the Lord. And I thank you that I am under law, the law of Christ. In the Spirit, I will walk in your ways and stay in fellowship with you all the days of my life. I will not be deceived by those who are going back into the ways of the Old Testament and physical keepings of all kind of fleshly ordinances. I have been delivered. I am dead to it. I am not under it any longer. Thank you, Lord. I am walking according to the law of Christ, the law of liberty, the law of the spirit of life, in Christ Jesus, in fellowship with the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I trust this has helped you and answered any questions that you might have because you get questions all the time. And again, you see people doing this all over. If you were thinking as we were going through this, certainly you would have thought maybe of places in the, in the body of Christ where yeah, they're doing this and this group's doing this and they're keeping this and they're observing all these kind of things. And it's total error. And it's very sad that we see people doing this. Don't let yourself be pulled into it. A lot of people try to pull you into these kind of things. Question? Let me add some. First of all, it depends on what they're teaching. If they're teaching, which is what a lot of them are teaching today, if you examine it closely, that you keep the Old Testament laws as well as the New Testament laws, there's a problem. Oh, yeah, if they're not teaching it in light of the New Testament truth, because the Old Testament, some people say, well, do I throw the Old Testament out? No. The Old Testament is all important for us because it all gives us revelation of all the things that have happened. There's types and shadows and very important truths that even couldn't even be fulfilled in the Old Testament. Plus, look, think of all the prophecies that came forth in the Old Testament that haven't even been fulfilled in the New Testament. So there's a lot of important things, but you're right. It's what, the thing you have to find out about the Jews, the, the ones you're talking about that have been believers, is are they also saying you keep the Old Testament laws, which a lot of them are, and watch by their actions if they're keeping the feasts, if they're keeping the Sabbath, if they're keeping the Sabbath, if they're keeping the, um, all the physical things, then there's a problem. Because I know the colleges teach the whole Old Testament. Well, you teach it, sure. You and, teach and it. And they're teaching that a lot of Jewish people don't know their heritage, so they're teaching the Old Testament, but they believe in Jesus. They believe we're under the new law. That's what I'm trying to say. As long as they're that way. 
The majority, at least most of all the ones that I've come in contact with are not that way. They're, they mix, they got the mixture, they got them both. That's the thing you have to be very careful of. And evidenced by, they keep the Sabbath. Evidenced by, they keep the feast days. Evidenced by, they'll, they'll do all these Old Testament type things. Yes? Yes, but here's the point. Why would I keep something that in essence has been replaced by communion? To keep something like that, the Seder you're talking about, right? Sure. I know everybody, that's what a lot of people think, but I would not keep that, I'll tell you why. Because it is all, it is a, you have to understand what the Jewish Seder says. The Jewish Seder says Jesus hasn't come yet. The Jewish Seder says, we hope he might come someday. The Jewish Seder says, we're waiting for Elijah to come to announce the Messiah's coming. Well, everything about all their, their steps going through that is a denial that Christ has come in the Seder ceremony. And it's all talking about their deliverance out of Egypt. It has nothing to do with what Jesus has done. If you examine it very closely, and I encourage you to do that because I wouldn't participate in it. That's where I'm at. I'm not interested in doing anything that's physical. That's not even true. Same way of keeping feast days or whatever all. Praise God. Any other questions? Hope it's been a blessing to you, help you, because we don't want to be falling back into the Galatians uh, era, that's for sure. God bless. You need prayer. I invite you to come forward. Have a wonderful day. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday. We're going to be talking about a lot of exciting things in this next coming week about what Jesus has accomplished for us. God bless. You're dismissed.